We are glad to greet you all here. Please take your seats. I will remind you that the lecture will be running in English. So if you are in doubt, please take the earphones for yourselves. We are glad to see you here. Thank you for coming. And the first thing that we have to thank uh, our guest is that we've got some great weather here and probably he brought it to, to us with him. This is the first lecture in the series called Garage Pro, organized jointly by Garage and the Ad Marginem Publishing House uh, with various art professionals, artists, curators and so on, uh, sharing their ideas about current trends and culture. Anastasia, please take place in the first seat. And so the first book that we're going to cover is called uh, Thinking Contemporary Curatorship. It was written three years ago, but it's still very much relevant, not just because it clearly shows what's happening in curatorships currently, but it's also relevant due to its academic uh, completeness and depth, because it provides a brilliant cross-referencing system. It's written in brilliant English, and now it has been successfully translated into Russian, and the author is Terry Smith. <laughs> Terry Smith has got many honors, affiliations, and so on, but the most important is that he is a professor at the Pittsburgh University, a professor in um, contemporary art and architecture, and that's the Andrew Mellon Professorship. Among his works are a number of books, the most important of them are perhaps Making the Modern, uh, written in 1993 and uh, awarded uh, with John Keefe Museum Award in 2009 as one of the most important books in the history of contemporary American art. Uh, what is Contemporary Art? Another intriguing for us book, written in 29. And then the book uh, we're going to discuss today was written in 2012. And another point to consider is that although Terry began working as an art critic, uh, and he has collaborated in the group of art and language in the 70s. Maybe you would like to ask Terry about his experience in that. And currently Terry works with institutions and he is a board member in two museums, the Pittsburgh Andy Warhol Museum and the Carnegie Museum. Where's the Carnegie Museum? And another crucial thing, after the lecture, you will be able to get your copies of the book signed by Terry. It will take place in the hall of our Shigeru Ban building. And the bookshop is open until 10 p.m. today. And today the book is sold at a discount price. And then, the last but not the least, you will be able to ask questions to Terry and the Q&A session will be moderated by Kate Fowle, the chief curator at the Garage Museum of Contemporary Art and the director of ICI, the organization that uh, published the book, published Terry's book. And we are very much grateful to ICI and Terry in person for receiving the rights for free to publish the book. That's why it's so cheap to buy. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. It tells you just how warm the welcome is that we've had to Garage. Everyone at Garage seems so happy and uh, so pleased to be doing what they're doing. And that, that spreads um, to guests such as my wife Tina, who's here, uh, and myself. So I thank you, and I thank Katja, I thank um, Masha as well, um, and all the people I've met who have been, been so, so good in your welcome. Particularly, of course, I thank Kate Fowle. Kate is an international phenomenon. She's a major figure in New York, 
um, I say a phenomena because she's in two. <laughs> That's plural. Um, she's as strong as she is in New York as she is in this city. Uh, and she's really behind not just OCI, but obviously the energy of Garage itself. Um, and she's clearly behind this book. Um, she was behind the book. She pushed me to write it. She read it. She improved it. Um, she looked at every word. and only got through because Kate made me suffer. <laughs> Um, so I give her a big compliment and for it to be published in Russian is very, um, it's very moving to me. Um, it's the first book of mine to be published in Russian and I hope there will be others um, and to have my words available to be read in the language of your country which I've always regarded as a great country, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So. Let me say that to begin with. Okay, for the next three quarters of an hour, I'm going to take you through answers to two questions. What is contemporary art and what is contemporary curating? They're very connected with each other and I have some very specific answers to both of them. They're quite distinct answers. You won't find them in anyone else's writings. You'll find bits of them and you'll find more and more of them in recent years, but at the moment they're fairly distinct. So let's begin with the first one. Uh, what is contemporary art? And I should point out that I'll be showing you a lot of slides, a lot of images with um, a lot of text on them. Everyone should have a copy in Russian of all the slides except one, which is the most complex, um, but we'll spend time to translate that. So I'm speaking now to the translator. Is this a good speed for you? We're going okay, fine. If you look at the screen, you can see that on the left-hand side of it are a series of terms, modernity, post-modernity, globalization in a question mark, and contemporaneity. They're all terms that are commonly used, except for the last one, to describe the state of world being, the set of social forces, the conditions of thought in the world that have given rise to all the elements on the right hand side that you see, these are the words we use for modern art. We use, uh, we've picked out various realisms within the history of modern art, different kinds of modernisms, including those that appeared in, in uh, different countries, vernacular versions, alternative to those in Europe and America. We use terms like avant-garde and, and we more recently use terms like late modern when we're talking about um, pop minimalism and conceptual art. There was a brief period when postmodernity looked as if it was going to be a period uh, in contradiction to everything that the term means and postmodernism would be a practice of, uh, for artists, it was for architects for a while but it really never took off and never settled, never became anything substantial. But it did give rise to various strategies, remix strategies, relational aesthetics, which I'm sure you've heard of, the idea of alter modernism, modernisms around the world. I read all of these as the first signs of contemporary art taking shape. They became, they help point towards contemporary art, but in and of themselves, they don't amount to um, a, a, either a world historical period or an art historical one. The term globalization, which may be a term, is a term many people use when they stop thinking beyond a certain range and are happy to say that the world is now globalized um, or capitalism is triumphing everywhere. Phrases like that people use, to me, are really inadequate descriptors. Inadequate descriptors. All they tell us is that I'm now about to stop thinking about what's happening. We actually have to start thinking at those points because it's usually at that point we're trying to be persuaded it, it's over, your power has gone. We can't do anything about how the world is when we reach those terms. So what I'll try and show you by the time we're finished is that the world is not only more complex but it's more interesting, it's more d diverse and it's more full of potential than any of those terms allow us to think. So the term contemporaneity, which I'll talk more about as we go along, um, is a term for the coexistence of different kinds of difference in the world. 
And therefore, it should not be a surprise to anybody that contemporary art itself should be thought about in a number of different ways. So, in this book, another uh, book I wrote a few years ago, What is Contemporary Art? Um, I answer the question, I say that there are in fact three currents, three different kinds of art have been made in the world in the past um, 30 or 40 years, because contempor contemporary art now is about 40 years old, maybe more, begins in the 80s or actually begins a bit earlier, but it takes uh, definite form, clear form throughout the world in different ways in the 1980s. And so what I suggest is that there are three different um, currents uh, of um, artistic practice. Now let me just see, what did I do? Go back one? No, okay, that's it. Um, there are three ways in which the world has become contemporary. Um, and if you like, and if you want to read these charts from left to right in time and from top to the bottom in terms of power, the distribution of power, Becoming contemporary in Euro-America, um, which is where art did first become contemporary, late modern art became contemporary. It did so via postmodernism, as I've mentioned, but it also did so via two other great tendencies which are still playing out. Um, and they're very prominent, and they're usually what people think of when they think of the terms contemporary art. What I call retro-sensationalism is exemplified by work such as this. This is a kind of art that depends on shocking your senses in a retro fashion. In other words, in a fashion that repeats early avant-garde practices, but is really obvious. About, it's about as interesting as, as retro fashion itself is interesting, which is marg not even interesting for one year. Um, but it, it's, uh, in other words, it's a kind of shock that you know you will survive. Um, which is why it's often called sublime, but this is small s, banal sublime, let's call it Damien Hirst, um, retro sensationalism. Uh, the, uh, the other uh, term is one of, all, of also invented called remodernism, which is about repeating modernism, trying to recuperate it, rejuvenate it, try and make it live. And I'll give you examples of that in just a minute. But if you look at this um, kind of chart and think about three sort of planes or three landscapes, three areas, three great sets of forces that have occurred across the world, particularly in Euro-America Euro at the top, and then coming out of the, all the, the parts of the world that actually liberated themselves from the imperial structures um, of the Cold War um, uh, period, in fact most of the 20th century in the Cold War period, the places that decolonized, the places that achieved new nationalisms, the places that um, had to confront globalization and try to think about a new internationalism uh, as a response to that, not as an acceptance of globalization, but as a, as a way of critically being in and working against, uh, working with and through and around at angles to globalization, which at a certain point in the 70s seemed to dominate the world and looked as if it would dominate the world. And that's led us to efforts to find various kinds of cosmopolitanism and to relate to each other via modes of translation, particularly artists. And artists have become translators in, in the most extraordinary fashion. Translation is, in a sense, the medium uh, for our practice um, all around the world uh, at the moment. And that's, again, that's also a movement through time. Um, one, two, three. Movement from literally the 60s, 70s up through the present. Contemporary concerns, the ones that occupy, I think, most of the people sitting in this room here, um, relate back to those two. And in the, right towards the end of this lecture, I'll, I'll talk in more detail about this. They obviously are, resonate with um, the, the battle that's going on between the first two currents. But they've actually generated different ways of thinking about what it is to be in the world, to make art politically rather than make over political art, for example, to be really concerned about the environment, potential catastrophe, and to rethink the planet in a, in a more constructive, rethink our contract or our relationship with the planet in a much, uh, in a way where we might in fact survive what we're doing to it. Um, 
Also, it's a kind of art that comes out of being immersed in social media or immediated, being um, immersed in media. Um, and artists now everywhere, as contemporary artists, are concerned with questions of time, not in an abstract sense, but as an affect, as something that actually affects who we are and how we, uh, what our sense of our being is. The book that was mentioned, Contemporary Art World Currents, um, tracks the changes you just saw. In fact, what I just showed you was the con contents page for that book. Um, and the book was published in English in two um, versions, not two versions, the, in, the um, words were the same, but the covers were different. And you may or may not know that the English language world is divided into publishers that um, are based in London and publishers that are based in New York. Um, you have to guess which cover was chosen by the English publisher and which one was chosen by the New York publisher. Can you guess? Exactly. So you've all guessed. The um, work on the right is an example of what I call remodernism. Richard Serra's, really, it's a great work uh, of sculpture um, at uh, Bilbao called The Matter of Time. And what Sarah is doing is recuperating the kind of inventive energy that, that uh, led him to create his splash pieces, his process works, his anti-form works in the 60s, which were absolutely amazing works, and turn that energy into something so static and dominating and, if you like, masculinist that um, it is in fact a world current. It's the one that comes from um, Europe and, uh, and the United States in, its, in a sense its worst form. Uh, and sweeps and moves around the world. It is the art of that kind of power. On the other screen is a work by Tracy Rose, who's a South African performance artist, who is uh, a queer artist, who's re-performing Rodin's The Kiss with her dealer, who's a gay American, African-American man. And they're performing it in a way that though obviously is very loving and it first of all looks as if it's um, a pornographic or erotic image, but it's not that. They're performing it in the um, National Gallery in, of, of South Africa in Johannesburg. And I chose it because it's an image of the different currents of the world coming together, if you like, in their vulnerability, in their vulnerability, which is utterly different from the sense of power that operates in the Richard Serra. In the case of the Sarah, we, the audience, are subject to that power and we feel vulnerable. In the case of the work by Tracy Rose, it's the opposite, opposite to that. Um, and that's important because the work by Tracy Rose exemplifies both, in a sense, my second current and my third current, has elements of both, whereas Richard Sarah does not belong in anything except that first current. All right. That's in a very brief way uh, a summary of the writing I've done about contemporary art among those three or four books and they're hundreds of pages long, but you've just heard a 10 minute summary of it. Okay, so please try and read the rest in some form or other. This is what thinking contemporary curating looks like when it's in English, um, which isn't bad. It looks like a series of neon signs. So it is a very American cover in that sense, I didn't realize. Compared to the great subtlety Camouflage design that uh, <laughs> this one is. Um, this one has. Anyway, it's the same book. Not a word has been changed, except there's a, a new introduction by Kate uh, in the book. Okay, thinking contemporary curating brings us to the second question I want to cover, and this is what I'll talk about mainly for the rest of the time here. What is contemporary curating? Okay, everybody curates nowadays. Everyone curates everything, all the time. Most people in this room have been doing a lot of curating during the day, uh, curating themselves, curating their relationships to your, your friends, curating a kind of circle of people whom you work with. In fact, curating an identity which you share and s with, with others. Um, curating a kind of lifestyle for yourself. And often, particularly if you use Pinterest or you know, um, Picasso Web, uh, Picasso in the older, older days, um, 
and a few of the others, if you use those, you're encouraged to curate your own life, curate the lives of your friends, um, and to in fact curate your life as if it was a work of art. I've got to tell you, it's not a work of art, okay? It's not a work of art. It may have art-like qualities, and I'd, I'd be very happy to discuss why it's not a work of art um, in, in the discussion. But you're being persuaded, um, and all of us have a sense that it's possible for us to create, if our lives, maybe not as a work of art, but at least as a kind of continuous, dedicated self-creation, a form of self-creation which is a bit like art making. Again, there are problems with this. To create is really hard to do, and to do it well is even harder. To make works of art that actually are significant works of art is unbelievably difficult. Um, almost no one does it well. So the sense that almost everybody in the world can curate and create themselves as works of art is such a fantastical fiction that it really needs um, some rethinking. But nonetheless, it's become a term or, or a sense of what curating is in international art worlds. There's become this weird sense that we've reached a stage after art where we can post-curate almost anything. And as I think I'll try and show you today, that's exactly the kind of dangerous non-thinking um, that we need to be aware of and against which I'm about to speak for some time. So, individual, if individual or collective freedom is to be achieved, the approach we, we take must be critical, it must be questioning, it must be interrogatory. And therefore, I did ask not just what is contemporary curating in this book, but my key question is what is contemporary curatorial thought? How do you think you know, as a curator? Can curating be a profession of thought and action uh, at least as profound as art criticism, art theory, um, art history at its best, and above all, art? at its best, because art at its best is always a thinking, uh, feeling, making, practice, okay? So how, how would we approach such a question? Well, the way I do it is through writing these four, four or five chapters. Um, and what I'll do is quickly run through those chapters in, um, with some images that kind of illustrate the main elements of the book, beginning with this one. The whole book came up when Kate Fowle and Claire Bishop organized a conference, the Now Museum. Really terrible title, but a terrific conference. <laughs> As if museums weren't always now, and if they ever were now, but it probably goes against the idea of museum as a mausoleum, but the, the, a museum as a live. So there's one of the panels and a few people on the panel fascinated audience members. Um, but the, the question, Kate came up to me after and says, your thinking, or at least the art historian's thinking, about works of art and about exhibitions is so different from the curator, curators who are doing their thinking and expressing themselves. What is so different about the way you, you guys think compared to them? So, in fact, I did pursue that, um, I, I did pursue that question through the book and I've tried to pick out some elements of it. So what I'm gonna do now is add to the materials in the book elements of a kind of schemata um, of the, uh, the, what I call the context of curating, the constituent elements of being a professional curator. And I use the word profession really importantly because to profess curating means you do it in such a way as you put yourself before the judgment of others and you profess a kind of career or a vocation of a curator, okay? It's like we as professors at universities profess our subject. Um, we don't profess ourselves, we profess our, our subject, our material. So if you're gonna do that, 
you usually um, are operating within a tradition uh, of practice that's been analysed by the practitioners and by other people, the historians of it, the theorists of it, for, often for, for many years, for at least a century or two, as in the case of the history of art history. Um, what I found was that that particular perspective on curating was hardly ever present. A few people had it, and they had it occasionally, but it, def it definitely was not part of the profession. It was as if everybody had to learn it anew and do it again on the job, as if that's what cur all curating amounted to. So what I've started to do, and this is where your handout starts to become relevant, is make charts of all of the elements of, um, in this case, the categories of being a professional curator. I'm not going to read these out. I'm just going to make a few comments about them for you to bear in mind, and hopefully you'll look at the list a bit later on and think, what has he left out? What can I add to that? Can I see myself in any of these frameworks? So this is a range. The basic idea of collecting, uh, sorry, of curating goes back to, at least in Latin, to curare, to care. Um, care for a collection, to conserve the collection, to display the collection. Moving out from, in all of these lists I'll show you now, we'll move out from institutions to more open um, frameworks. You work your way down the list, you can do it yourself, it's quite easy, towards the point that I was talking about before, where curatorial activity merges with, um, with art-like activity and more generally creative modes, uh, modes of being. So that's the range of ways of being a curator. A curator of art, obviously, is what I'm talking about here. Um, a curator of art. But then, and this is the next important point, what I, one of the absolute things I found was distinctive about curatorial thought was that curators give priority to thinking about the exhibitionary potential and character of works of art. And you might think, well, that's obvious. But artists don't do that when they begin their work. Critics, when they look at a work of art, are responding to that work and trying to make clear to themselves how it came into being and why it has suddenly changed the way they look at art and the world. Why has that happened to me now? Art historian will try and track why is this work of art part of a larger set of tendencies that over a longer period of time have changed the nature of art or given us a different perspective on the world, um, become representative of this culture, shown us something about the nature of human sexuality um, and the nature of violence, the character of human secrets, secrecy, things like that. Um, Curators also are very responsive to those, uh, those kind of questions. Um, and they do so, uh, they respond to those questions, but they respond by trying to think, how can I put this work next to another work in this space to give people looking at these works of art a journey through time and space that will take them into thinking and feeling about these questions in ways that's never happened before. So the medium of curating is exhibitionary space with works of art in them. And therefore, curators often look at works of art for the potential that they have to, to um, become uh, agents or to be active in such a space. And this also applies when curators work with artists to bring a work of art into existence for an exhibition which is very much a practice of contemporary curating. The curator is contemporary with the artist. The artist and the curator work together to make works for an exhibition. The largest exhibitions, um, documentary obviously, Venice and so on, are full of commission works um, that have been man uh, you know, manufactured, if you like, or brought into being in this fashion. The point is there's a convergence of artistic and curatorial thinking at those moments. They're actually distinct in character, but they converge and come together in those moments. Okay, but curators don't think about exhibitions just 
in, in some abstract fashion. Curators know the history of exhibitions usually incredibly well. And what I find fascinating about conversations with curators is that most of them can remember where every work was in every exhibition that they've been to, or at least many of them, the ones that really count for them. If you get into a conversation, it's literally about, oh, did you see how you put that next to this and this and this? And then you went around the corner and then you saw that. And so therefore you started with this, but you ended up leaving the exhibition with that, right? And everything goes in between. 100 work of, works of art organized as this uh, narrative. Um, okay, but those are, uh, but nonetheless, exhibitions themselves have a history and they have a, a whole character that goes right back to the original private collections, um, particularly were formed particularly in Europe uh, in the 15th century, uh, more in the 16th and then in a much greater extent in the 18th and gradually became public during the 19th. So I'll talk about that more in a minute. But exhibitions usually have these, uh, are like these, they're one of these types of exhibition. Um, almost every art exhibition is one of this sort of exhibition. And again, this is all listed in Russian on your sheet of paper uh, under that heading, Exhibitions Type Sold. So again, I'm not going to read it. This is more for your information later. But curators will, will think not just about certain works of art, but they'll think about them within the framework of a type of exhibition. Okay. Now. There's a larger set of forces that go on that shape the context in which um, curators think and do their work. And it's what I call the exhibitionary complex. Complex in English means the convergence of things, how they've come together, not the fact that they're complicated. Right? The coming together, the complex of things. There's a whole complex of uh, institutions, approaches, professions, spaces, all sorts of things that come together to form the complex that allows exhibitions to happen in our societies. So the term comes from uh, Tony, uh, Tony Bennett, the sociologist and historian of museums. You can think about the complex on a spectrum. So on the one hand, we have the spectrum of what we call universal art history museums, massive piles, institutionally absolutely central to uh, the history of art itself or a nation state, one of the great national institutions, for example, in the United States, Metropolitan Museum of Art, a great treasure house of art from everywhere. Uh, that's one end of the scale. At the other end of the scale, I just take a local example. A group of artists working at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, who are very um, politically active artists, um, decided, just as an artwork, to create a kind of takeout um, in one of the suburbs of Pittsburgh where they would only sell food made by countries with which the United States was at war. Okay. So during these periods, now of course that gives you a lot of scope. I mean, there are a lot of wars um, the United States is involved in. So in this case, Afghan and Iran, they're up to Palestine at the moment. Um, and um, after the bombing of Gaza, it became Palestine became the place, what you get to eat. And in a sense, that's in a way, it's just a, a franchise, it's a takeout. But the art character of it is that it's produced by a group of artists, it presents itself through its visual character, it's a politically interventionist practice, it's not for profit, it's, it's none of that stuff, it's just about keeping itself going. But it is an absolutely occasional temporary intervention that takes exhibitable form that absolutely the opposite of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It could finish tomorrow and it will finish. It actually moved right near my office at the University of Pittsburgh. So there's lots of university students who are very happy to eat at such a place. So let's hope it keeps going for as long as universities um, survive, which will be actually forever. Now, whether that makes it contemporary or not is another question. <laughs> All right, so let's think about the exhibitionary complex. It is quite complex. I'm going to need two slides for it. Um, it moves from Universal Art History Museums, as I said, to what you just saw, but it actually goes through a whole series of quite specific 
um, formed in the sense of what museums are dedicated to. And every type of museum on this list, um, every type of exhibitionary space has its own logic and character. It exists because of a failing in another part of the complex. It's been created or invented because something hasn't been done by some other part of the complex. So we move all the way along here. Um, people spend their lives now in one or other of these. In some countries, very fortunate countries like the United States and Australia, Germany and very few others, all of these spaces exist in most of the, the major cities. So you have an exhibitionary complex that itself is so complex that you have people working in parts of it who aren't even aware that there are other parts in the complex. That's one side of it. The other side of it is that the energy of this complex exists not only because of external forces, political forces or people with money who want to help get out or do one thing or another or support one part of the system compared to another part. It exists because everyone involved in any one of these organisations knows that their organisation cannot survive in and of itself and so it needs to draw energy from the others. So people are being recruited from one place to another. Exhibition, ways of doing exhibitions that are distinct within each of these are imitated in the other. So you have this massive system at least massive in some countries, that feeds off itself and gives itself energy and has done so in a massive way for a long while. So the very idea that we're in a state after art, which you may read about in certain magazines, is a joke, beyond belief a joke. Um, there's so much art being produced for so many more people uh, in so many different ways um, that that idea is, is nuts. But still, it has some subtle aspects that I would be happy to chat about in discussion, if you wish. So the exhibitionary complex keeps on going. goes all the way down to recurrent public events of the kind that you see there. OK. Now, I'll give you quickly just some examples of what these different kinds of um, exhibitionary spaces look like in um, uh, different parts of that complex. So, you get a sense of how they change and how they can adjust or not adjust by, for example, comparing these layers. So when MoMA reopened in 2004 in New York, the, uh, the way the rooms um, from the 1910s, you know, really from Picasso onwards up until the 60s and 70s, the way that work was displayed was pretty good. It's the white cube. MoMA does it better than anyone else. Uh, they have a better collection than anyone else, and so on and so on and so forth. So you'd expect that. When, however, they get to contemporary art, which you see down the bottom, the only thing that was different, and this slide distorts the difference, is that the rooms were twice as high, and the works of art in them were twice as big, or three times as big, Julie Moretu over here, Jeff Wall on the left, um, uh, Dolores Salcedo in the middle, um, various other um, bits of performance work which just totally uh, disappears. Um, so everything, suddenly we look around and realise that from the point of view of the Museum of Modern Art, contemporary art is, is art being made recently that looks like paintings and looks like sculptures, as opposed to the mediums in which most contemporary art is made, which of course are installations, videos, etc., interactions between people, performance, community work, etc. None of that stuff was in the opening, or one or two of these works only were in the opening, and they really have struggled to build that into the um, into the museum ever since. But it's a classic sort of uh, dilemma of modernism. Another thing you can do, which Tate Modern did when it opened, is what I call contemporize the collection. In other words, you take works of, in this case, late modern uh, art, Richard Long, put it next to an early modernist work uh, by uh, Monet, and uh, the, the, the making contemporary of both of those two is how you introduce an historical narrative that takes you, in effect, beginning with Monet and back to Richard Long. And they did that 
you know, under four different headings, thematic headings, in their collection. So that's another a way of shifting the universal art history idea, trying to make it contemporary. Uh, they've kept changing it ever since then. A third approach is to just spectacularize everything. Produce um, a building that is so much more spectacular than the work that's in it um, that everything becomes contemporary, including the building uh, itself. But it really, in the end, reduces itself to spectacle and produces spectators like this. I'm sure is a, a lovely young woman and all the rest of it, but nonetheless, her response to art is, <sighs> wow. And it's just almost like uh, a movie, the day of the Triffids, you know. It's like the creation of the undead, sort of a totally empty uh, figure. Um, and I'm sure the photograph was meant to show just how entrancing it was to be in Carsten Holler's uh, uh, installation called itself um, Experience. And he was drawing attention to this is what happens when you go to a museum now, it's all full of bells and whistles and things you can swing and, and he was trying to be actually critical about the experience economy um, that museums now are very much part of. But unfortunately he really ended up just representing it or replicating it. Um, so there's lots of different forms of exhibitionary space now as you know. Um, this is, uh, in fact, a, a media installation of the history of biennials, starting with, uh, actually starts earlier. There are obviously Venice um, in 1875 and Carnegie International in 1876, uh, sorry, 1895 and 96. Um, but it really takes off in the mid-1980s uh, with the uh, Biennale de Habana, Cairo and various other places until you get into out part of the century and everything, it's impossible to represent how many biennials there are. The relevance of putting that image up is because we're moving to uh, a situation in which the exhibitionary complex is including within it not only um, spaces that are static or rooms that are in one place like this one, although you're moving back and forth between two or three spaces, um, and you'll probably keep on doing it around the park, but who knows. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the permanency of each structure now is, is, um, is obviously shifting a lot. But the important point I want to make here is that biennials, sorry, biennials, biennials, are now being, as it were, built into the structure of contemporary art and contemporary curating. Biennials have this wonderful feature they happen every two years. You don't know what's going to be in them, but you know you will find something you didn't know before about art every two years. You can rely on that, okay? You can rely on being surprised. If not, the curator's not going to get to do too many more biennials. Um, so, but it's a structural, it's a way of building contemporaneity into the structure of, um, of exhibition making. And usually biennials are now making relationships not just with temporary spaces in cities but with the more permanent exhibitionary complexes and spreading to those as well as spreading out away from those. So they're replicating the whole structure that I'm trying to show you. The structure which is complex, it spreads through space, it depends very much on permanent, permanent claws into the ground but it also equally at the other end depends on transformation and constant transformation and uncertainty about what's going to happen next. The, it's the folding or the breathing in and out of those two that the whole system uh, works with exhibitionary complex. Now within that, within exhibitions themselves, there's these historical forms of display, which I've been hinting at in the images I've just shown, that go in Europe from the 15th century all the way along through here. And again, you've got it on your list, so I'm not going to pick them out. But it's very interesting. Uh, they're almost equivalent to the history of styles and the history of art. I mean, they don't match the history of styles. They're not the same kind of thing. And they, the other interesting thing is they don't, re, they don't obliterate earlier styles to the same extent that artistic practice styles in artistic practice are pushed back in time. It's a curious paradox of our contemporary situation 
that we keep accumulating pasts, right? People keep repeating pasts of various kinds, and they keep filling up the present. So you'll find nearly all of these forms of display, somewhere or other, um, being repeated uh, all over the world, or just left there because people haven't been able to think about how to change them or afford to change them. Well, okay, a few more examples of that. What we're starting to see nowadays is an effort to create museum designs and museum layout that absorb change. Sana in this building has one entrance, just on the right-hand side there, but there's no pathway given in the building, uh, through the building and through, through what you're looking at. Okay, part of the reason for this set of transformations, this is another uh, chapter in the book which I'll run through quickly, um, is that there are different sort of modes of exhibitionary meaning that have actually been developed since the 1960s. So not only do we have that long history of general categories, we also have changes quite specifically in the last few years within what it is to make an exhibition. That's a list of them. If you want to read an article where I describe these in detail, I'm sure the library here has a copy of the catalogue of the exhibition When Attitudes Become Form, Bern 1969, Venice 2013, in which I have an essay that describes all of this in, um, in more detail. Okay, I'll show you some examples of these different kinds of curating um, as we look at it by artists, obviously all sorts of great examples of artists curating their own museums, artists raising the questions institutional critique, although Hans Harker was really being anti-corporate uh, sponsorship and political sponsorship of museums, trying to get museums to be places of political activism, he wasn't just critiquing the institution, he was early on part of a, a world uh, critique which Art Language was also part of, where we envisaged a future world without museums, altogether, totally without them. At that point, that was something you really had to do. So it got later on when uh, artists like Joseph, who I gather was here a few uh, weeks ago, um, when he um, was invited to rehang museum collections, which here he did a, an exhibition on the history of censorship in the arts, uh, which was the first time that had been done on such a scale. Um, uh, quite an amazing piece of um, work, and a work of his, which he saw as a work. Um, so in cases like that, you do have artists um, uh, acting critically, curating critically, but he's actually curating cr uh, critically uh, in this case. Uh, Fred Wilson, a classic example, bringing uh, elements relating to slavery into the foreground of this Museum of History within Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland, where they've just actually declared national emergency, a state of national emergency, because of the, the questions of race within that city uh, are still massively unresolved, to put it mildly and politely. Um, Andrea Fraser uh, re-performing aspects of, or performing aspects of what it is to be uh, a member of a museum, in this case a museum docent, but turning them into a kind of uh, ridiculous exaggeration so that they operate as a critique of the kind of knowledge that museums uh, were producing about art. Um, totally different. Um, a whole series of styles of art making, uh, of exhibition making that have that follow from the curatorial thinking about how their work is best shown of certain very influential artists. There's about a half a dozen different styles um, that artists, in this case Don Judd, for minimal forms of display, um, have really set the tone for how museums all over the world will display minimal art. The documentation exhibition is an invention of, uh, of various conceptual artists, for example. That's something incredibly common now, the idea that artworks in museums document art that mostly is, in fact, outside the museum in one way or another. It's an idea that Boris Groys has theorised 
very um, thoroughly and um, beautifully for us. Um, other artists, such as Ian Gillick, um, who are in, in love with the sort of design logic of corporate capital, um, create environments that build that kind of design uh, into, the, into the museum and present that as their work, but which is also an exhibition. So exhibitionary logic is, for in, for in his particular case, is something he pays a whole lot of attention to, styles of exhibition making. So let's move to the final part of what I want to talk to you about, which is curating contemporaneity, curating uh, the elements of that larger world that I um, spoke about in terms of the three currents of uh, contemporary art. So we get some indication of how you might approach that from Documenta 13, uh, Carolyn Christophe Bacavia, particularly in her part of the museum, The Brain, which was in fact the ideas about art and in fact the impact of the world upon art. So she was wanting to show the world's impact upon artistic practice within a museum um, and to actually try and show something fairly deep, that art is wounded by the world. Art is constantly, in fact, hurt by the world. Uh, it's not as if art can just come from somewhere and decide to be about the world or be at a distance from the world. We're, we're all of us in one way or another, in the sort of society we live in, hurt and often harmed by the world. And that's a subject for art. That can be a subject for art. And in her case, um, it was indeed a subject for art. So we're getting into the territory of asking what should one curate? We're getting into the ethics, the potential ethics of curating, which is not just about being professional and nice to your colleagues and accepting diversity and so on and so forth. Um, it's about what you should curate in our circumstances. It's also about the question of where does criticality come from? Where does the idea of the critical come from now? We're meant to be in a post-critical period. We're not in a post-critical period. We're in such a critical period we cannot give up criticality. So one place that clearly comes from is from the history of exhibition making that we need to be critical of even as we try and rejuvenate, as we try and keep it alive, as we try and make it grow um, and do different things. And also criticality comes from what the world is asking of us as curators or as artists or as art historians. So let me now move for a couple of minutes to curating contemporaneity. And this you don't have in front of you, and this is a picture um, of how most of us, in one way or another, think about bits of the world. And what I've tried to do here, and I'll spend about five minutes on it and then I'll conclude, okay? Um, what I'm trying to do here is show you the kind of world, the conditions of contemporaneity, the sort of world we're in, and particularly I'm showing it to you, I can only show it to you here, through the kind of terms and the big concepts, the world picturing concepts that are regularly used or often used um, around the world now to understand, in a sense, the whole world. Okay, so this is big stuff, big. Curating has to operate within this framework. It doesn't have to be about all of this. It can't be about all of this. Nothing can be about all of it, but bits of it. So there is, like there were three currents in contemporary art coming from different parts of the world at different times, in my point of view, from my point of view, there are three kinds of ways of thinking about the world that are in contention with each other now. And they coexist with each other very uncomfortably often, but they're there. There's a set of continuing modernities and all of the terms on that top list, every single term, is like a signpost pointing you into a world description that claims to be total. Globalization, when it was defined in the 70s, claimed to define what was going to happen over all over the world, bring everyone together under that heading. 
one post-Cold War hyperpower of the United States. Nonsense, obviously. Clash of civil. All of those terms you'll know about. Um, and they include, as you see, re-modernism. So they're, in fact, the great structures. Um, I could have added in neoliberal economics. And there's a whole series of, of general terms that are world historical terms that dominate within Europe and the United States, obviously, even though they're being shaken up a lot at the moment. And that, but there's another whole set of ideas about what the world's really like that have come up from countries, which actually includes this country, that have been in uh, contestation with the world pictures that you see up above. There are many people in each, in this country, amongst others, who want to be in that, if you like, first world, and want to be in a world that's dominated by that lot. There's many others who don't. Um, and there's many people who won't let you in, even if you think you want to be in it. Nonetheless, there's a whole thing what I call transnational transitionality, or it's the idea that a nation, or thinking about yourself as a nation, or being within a nation, is in transition. It's the idea that it will always be in transition. Right? Not just in relation to other nations, but in relation to itself. It will always be the case that concepts of nationality will be in transition. And that's true in a banal way, but it's obviously also a way we need to think against nationalist essentialism um, and parochialism. All these elements are there once you look at any one of the parts of that second list. So a whole different way of thought has emerged from, if you like, the rest of the world to impact upon Western thinking over the past 30 or 40 years. And so have artists. Enormous numbers of artists have come out of this current and have dominated the biennial circuit um, and have been active throughout the world as international artists in one way or another, including many from this country, amongst others. There's been a long dialectic of struggle between North and South, East and West, uh, all the rest of it. It'll never resolve itself. Neither side is going to dominate. As well as that, there's emergent, and this parallels that third current of contemporary art, there's an emergent, a whole different, um, again, it's generational. Many people in this room know about all the previous stuff in the first two currents, but you're actually in a world that's shifting and moving, um, where different kind of demands, different kind of interests, also uh, a less world historical and perhaps a lower, more, uh, small scale, but nonetheless crucial way of thinking about what it is to be in the world is operating compared to the first two. Because again, this is something that as a map moves across 30 or 40 years, moves from top down in terms of power. But my key argument about it all is that the first current is declining into history. The second current is now almost dominant and the third current will eventually push them both out over time. Okay. So that's what I mean by contemporaneity. The contemporaneity of each of these different ways of being in the world that these terms indicate. Um, all of them imperfectly, but they do so. So let's quickly look at some examples of that in art as it manifests itself. How do you respond to that? One way, by recurating, by re going back and repeating earlier exhibitions where some of the energies of these changes started to appear. And that's what this when attitudes become form exhibition did. Totally strange to see the most transformatory art of the 1960s inside an 18th century palace in an extraordinarily expensive environment in the privileged setting of the Venice Biennale. Very, very strange. Where particular works of art that meant, meant a huge amount to me as a, as a young artist uh, at that time, uh, a student, in fact, before, uh, being in art language, as, as, a, as a young student, this was the work that signaled that the world was changing totally for me. Um, it looks weird in these slides, it looks like antiquarian uh, natural history museum of avant-garde art. Um, but if you went long enough, you actually forgot about the palace and the work and the relationships between these works was phenomenal. They're all made by artists bringing stuff and just doing them on the spot. 
So they had that character. Now they look like mummies, I know. It's very hard to make that difference. But there they go. The contrast between utterly different cultures first came up in this great exhibition, at least as far as Europe was concerned, although there were other shows in London. There's a whole section in the book about different kinds of art from different parts of the world. Similar artists from Africa have become very important. And again, in a case like this, when there's no infrastructure um, or very little museum infrastructure, um, ways of understanding intellectually your practice, artists themselves create these museums or environments. In this case, Michel Garber does create these mobile museums of contemporary African art, of which there are virtually none in the, uh, on that whole entire continent. Um, rethinking histories, it's amazing that uh, East of Europe, uh, which, also, which includes Russia, East of Europe, being East of Europe in certain ways, um, the dream of modernism as it, as it occurred in Paris and New York becomes a fantastical dream of almost total purity. Um, again, nonsense, total nonsense. But there's an artist uh, who now calls himself Walter Benjamin, who's um, created various exhibitions over the years, right back from Ljubljana in the 80s, uh, under the name of Malevich, um, where this artist has, has, as it were, relived the, um, uh, literally become that artist at a much later time, a much later period. So there's that kind of vision, uh, another kind of weird re-modernism, retro avant-garde, um, there he is there, Belgrade 1986, the Malevich. Repeating, creating avant-gardes when they, they weren't there before, but making them contemporary, crucial in Ljubljana, doing so in relation to uh, feminism, feminist art practice in contexts where feminist art practice was extremely rare uh, and exhibitions like that. Again, the repetition of works such as works made here uh, or works made out in the countryside when no abstract art, as pathetic as it was, was not permitted in this city. So various people, that's Boris Gross on the left when he was a very young man, for those of you interested. I'm sure you've seen that image a hundred times, but I find it fascinating. Um, this group, as you know, what is to be done, sort of a lot, um, creating activist works um, in museums everywhere. Just currently at EFLUX in New York um, by uh, Asini Juleyev, is that right? Close. <laughs> New Powers to the Objects, he's created uh, an installation that's quite amazing. It actually shows um, on this wall uh, a kind of timeline that moves um, from the 1930s up through the present. And each of the people mentioned there have become part of a, um, a collective artwork that's in fact managed by your current president uh, who is the chief artist uh, in this uh, example of the uh, of a state of art? The whole country has become one work of art of the president, and all of these um, artists have fed their works into it, up until the point where apparently now a group of artists called the Cossacks are the artists who are the, as it were, uh, agents of, of security in keeping this um, this state of art. Um, in its, in its perfect form. Um, so the exhibition moves along, um, including this cat scene from behind. Uh, this is the installation space. And then these closer up examples, uh, actions of, of the president. His various public political actions are interpreted as works of art, particularly deeply concerned with ecology, the ecology of the environment that we're standing in. and. Uh, more specifically, this is his interventionist artwork, um, putting the pussy right people in jail for a while, which was a particular kind of reaction to their artwork. So that's all seen as an artwork. Okay, just to give you a sense of how aspects of, um, of your country is being presented by one of your younger artists in New York at the moment. Um, the sense of 
different cities and what they're like, uh, how they change and how they move is a crucial subject for curating, as in this case. Activist curating uh, is now becoming very important. And it's, I speak about it a lot under the heading of, um, of infrastructural activism, being active not only in producing works of art, not only in what your, the subject matter of your work, which in fact just looked at a work of political art in a certain sense, um, but thinking about uh, subjects um, such as this kind of art and social life, social practice as art practice, the two of them being collecting, um, collectively in and of themselves, is part of this larger thing that in New York we had a little taste of during the Occupy moment when Occupy actually was the most um, energetic uh, intellectual uh, activity that was occurring. And what it was doing was creating new audiences. And I'm not going to go through all of this again in detail, but just pursue this as the last point I'll make. What we've moved is all the way from structures of various kinds, all these different frameworks, we moved towards a greatly increased role um, and activity for what used to be called audiences, people who would come in and listen, like you guys are listening to me. And museums regularly break them down into these categories, which you see listed there. But there's a kind of reverse way of looking at them as publics, as seen from the other direction, which is what the EFLUX and various other groups, particularly younger artist groups, are doing now, in parallel and very close to the kind of pin interest type self-curating and group friends curating with friends that I mentioned before, sharing many of those qualities and mediums, but again, trying to do so uh, critically. And when you do that, it becomes important to identify um, people along these kind of lines um, as part of your um, your frame of reference. So finally, I'll end with this image. So this is how the book ends. The book ends with a series of, of statements that are not my, um, my not even my recommendations. Um, they're not my rules for how to curate contemporaneity or be, contem be a contemporary curator. They're really a kind of list of terms and ideas that I've heard curators um, you know, say to themselves. These are a kind of what I call you know, notes to self, things I must do, things I must remember, like put them on your fridge. So I'll just quickly run through them and then I'll stop. So exhibit art's work. Exhibit the work that art does is absolutely essential for any kind of curating. Renounce the reticence that makes you disappear behind what it is um, behind the exhibition or behind the artist. If you're curating something, you're making a meaningful public statement, make the statement, make it clear you're making it. Curate reflexively, that's one of Kate's phrases, reflexive curating, think about curating, think about the practice as you're doing it, make it clear that this is what you've thought about it in the show. Build research capacity, articulate your thinking, Archive the achievements. Don't just think because you put on the exhibition on the wall that that's enough. It's not enough. Keep it there. People want to go back to it. They want to learn from what you learned from doing the exhibition. Reinvent exhibition formats. Turn the complex. Make the complex more complex. Turn it around. Proliferate alternative exhibition venues. Activate infrastructure. And we're just speaking about audiences. Embrace spectatorship. So the final summary thing is curate contemporary and art society, past art, present art, and art to come, and do so critically. Thanks for listening. Okay. So at the beginning of your um, lecture, you were talking about the fact that at one stage, there were... Um, if you like, the critics, the art historians, and the curators. And so um, you're explaining how the art historians are kind of understanding the context of the way that work is made. The critics are responding to the work once it's there, but kind of in, in the moment. 
in relation to contemporary society. And the curators are the people who kind of almost have first contact, if you like. They could be in the studios with the artists, um, or you suggested that they're the ones that should listen a little bit more and read a little bit more about what has actually gone on historically in terms of understanding and describing a work of art. Um, here in particular, and in many places, um, the artist is often the critic, is often the curator, is often the art historian, um, and it's um, less apparent, perhaps, um, the way in which these demarcations have happened. So I wonder if you can talk, one, a bit about that, but also in relation to what you said at the end, which is like, where does criticality come from now? Because there's a big question as to whether the um, critics are still the place where criticality comes from, um, or the art historians. And I know that curators often think that they are now the criticality. So can you talk about what happens when uh, maybe all the functions turn into one person, or become one person's job, and what criticality is now? Okay, a great, uh, great question. Is this working? Yes. Yeah. So what you're describing is how things were in Sydney in the late 60s, when I started writing. Um, even though on the one hand we had uh, people writing reviews for the local newspapers, of which there were seven in the city, and I think about a similar number across the country, about 20 different uh, essays, a thousand words, 1500 words, about what was in the galleries by critics um, every week, and then monthly magazines. So very rich critical, or rev more reviewing, <laughs> art reviewing environment. It is a problem when, um, at that point, one was also a teacher, because we, only, we had only the second department of art history in Australia at that time. Um, one also curated exhibitions and um, acted as an artist as well. And many of the people writing critical commentary were in fact artists. Many of the people who were directors and curators in uh, museums were artists. Artists were the majority of people on the boards of museums. So you had um, not only lots of conflicts of interest everywhere, and lots of people putting their own works in museums and in public places, which happens when these things get confused. These people also often were heads of the art school or the teachers at the art school. So criticality, <laughs> in other words, the actual crucial thing that an artist needs and we all need, no matter where we are within this exhibitionary complex, within this system, we all absolutely need the critique and judgment and description that comes from somebody who is committed above all to art and not to you <laughs> as someone whose life they want to make easier or from whom they want to have a favour or and so on and so forth. So it is difficult. Um, but nonetheless, I think a number of people, and definitely the people who last and whose work is read later, I mean, there might be people who do well during their own lifetime, but if they haven't actually produced pieces of writing or works of art or created an organisation that doesn't have independent critical judgement and really accurate understanding of history, plus a deeply ethical relationship to how art works in society. If that is not at the core of what they've done, what they've done will not last and never has lasted. Um, it'll become the fiction that it always was. And um, there we go. So it, it, it's, it is difficult, but the practicalities of it are never an excuse for not being subject to the qualities I've just outlined. It is possible to pursue them, and it means that the individual who is, is, is often you know, a curator, a critic, an art historian, a teacher, 
I mean, I've actually done all of these roles, but in each one of them, um, I have tried, and many of the people I work with have tried, to follow them as if they had their own essential quality, right? Their own kind of purity, if you like. I mean, it sounds naive, but that's what one's tried to do. The curator in particular, going back to that question, is the person in that framework who has this profound responsibility of making a work of art public for the first time, right? The artist, in a certain way, imagines a public or envisages a public, but most artists have to make the work they make. They often make it in, for reasons they don't fully understand, can't articulate, and in fact discover what the work is when they've finished it. And at a certain point, know that that's, as, that's where I have to stop now. Um, it's the curator is the first person to come and see that. Or even if it's an art dealer or another artist who's a friend of that artist, that's, that's the beginning of curating. And but that can stay within the private circle of the artist, if you like. But to actually take the step of making that public, choosing that work to put it out next to that work, another work, because it means X, Y, and Z for a potential public, that's the thing a curator does before an art critic. You know, the art critic is the next one who comes along and looks at the work as exhibited by a curator of some kind and, and tries to imagine what my readers would make of this. How can I give them a bridge to what I've understood about this work? An art historian comes along later, an art theorist even later in a way. So that's how it ends. So, so um, criticality is to, um, to kind of summarize what you said, criticality is to maintain a focus on the essential aspects of whatever is at hand, whatever art or exhibition is at hand. And the curators, the essential aspect of a curator's way of being critical is to make public, think through what making public is um, in terms of a practice, like making art public. Can I just add to that? Criticality is a term used a lot in the United States um, art critical discourse, in particular to mean work that has a kind of negative capability that in the way in which it turns its back on the world. Um, this is Adorno, this is Theodore Adorno, um, his theory that given the way the world was after the war, um, what happened in the 30s, 40s and 50s in Europe, um, it became, you know, the only possible form a work of art could take was to deny its own potential for beauty, for lyricism, for seductiveness, for attractiveness, even deny its own capacity to represent or show anything about the world. So the truly critical work of art is one that, as it were, critically imploded or destroyed itself in front of our eyes and buried itself in its own medium. Uh, and unfortunately that view has persisted and echoed right through right through the whole late modern period, right through the rise of capital, I mean, right through all the things I'm talking about today, and it's become so distended from what actually, uh, what the world is asking. The world is now so much more complex than it was after the Second World War, uh, asking so many different kinds of things from so many different angles. That, uh, that particular approach has reduced criticality to a quality of the work, right? As if it was a, a medium, as if criticality was a medium you could touch and look at. You can't. It's about how you behave in a circumstance, a set of circumstances. It's about being able to read the circumstances, being able to um, see how to act in a way that advances freedom in those circumstances, not George Bush type freedom, genuine freedom in those circumstances. Uh, very hard to see how, what advances the coeval, the possibility that we could all be in the world, not the same, but in a way that respected all of our differences. You know, th these, are, these are quite, these are things that are hard to, to actually identify and specify, but they are possible. They are done frequently and constantly 
by a lot of the work that I showed and by writers and theorists, they're, they're done. It's not impossible. Anyway. Okay. All right, questions from the floor. You can put that down, actually. If, if, if I may, I'll ask in English. Um, as you quite rightly said, there's no end of art in sight. But uh, I think that for a couple of decades, the, all the, the, the gist of the argument about the end of art was that uh, we witness, we are witness to the end of the romantic notion of art. And do you think that it is finally the case now where the, when the professional artists, especially the global world, has become quite uh, domesticated in a way by all those institutions and types of institutions that you had in your presentation. Okay, um, okay. this is complex. The, um, so, okay, so the answer is uh, yes and no. Um, the uh, idea of the end, end of art um, or after art is really a shorthand for many people who want to say that this critical capacity that art has has been so absorbed by capital and neoliberalism that that kind of art, the kind of art that really came out of the whole Enlightenment tradition can't be made anymore and in that sense we are now after art. The second sense we're meant to be after art is that all the social media that I mentioned um, enable us to curate ourselves, to turn ourselves into works of art, our friends into work. Who needs art, right? So that's the other end of art thing. Now, I'm actually against both of those. I think the first one is a misdescription and what I've laid out to you tonight about contemporary art is a stronger description and that it has within each of those currents uh, elements and aspects. So my short answer on that side of it would be that that whole end of art or after art may be true of the, as you call it, domesticated, but also very weak kind of art that's being produced by the markets in the United States and Europe. I mean, you can't get any more vacuous, empty, weak, but massively large and expensive art than Jeff Koons, for example. <laughs> so, in a certain, and there's virtually no art in it because it's disappeared into pop culture imagery totally. Right? It keeps the difference between high art and low art alive, but by absorbing both of them into the same thing. And like Murakami, he kind of imagines a world that's entirely full of the imagery of that artist. So that would be an end of art, be the end of everything, be just totally a nightmare. So, so that one, so in that sense it's over. So the short answer is I think that all those issues are issues for the first current I spoke about, um, but the energies in all the other things I've been speaking about um, are different in kind and character and will make that um, concern, that concern will, will disappear in time, I believe. I think there was another part to the question, which was um, how have institutions or museums or the spaces that it's showing started to kind of absorb or create the end of that art as well? Is that? Um, you something going? Yeah. Now, how have they created, absorbed the end of art? Or to... say it again. Yeah, sorry. I, didn't I just think it's uh, I, th I think that you're maybe right about the market but we don't have a market, so I can't only, you know, imagine how it would be. But I was talking about all, all actually, all kinds of institutions that you had in the list, from the artist run spaces to museums to galleries to everything. It's a kind of, it, it is a pattern of domestication of art that is, uh, that subjects the artists uh, to a mode of production and uh, for a lot of these institutions, uh, avant-garde or you know, progressive as they can be, a lot of uh, their mode of a lot of their modes of productions are uh, constructed in such a way that the art that goes out of these uh, institutions is pretty much, 
you, you know what it would be like in the next show. So uh, what I'm saying is it's not that it's bad, but it's the end of the romantic notion of uh, something original uh, happening somewhere. And uh, maybe that's, yeah, it's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's yeah. just a thought. Yeah. Yes, okay. thought. I think probably in that first current, there's such a general collapse of um, critical theory and critical understanding um, that almost the only thing left is a romantic notion of the artist. So the art market, as you say, is not very strong here, but in the United States, Europe and various other places, it's so present and so dominant that um, almost no art, I mean, for example, when I went to visit the work at Eflux, um, so few people actually go to Eflux <laughs> that the young man who wanted to, they had to actually find someone to open the door, right? And that was on a Saturday. So, um, so it, it is massive and massively expensive there and in China and various other places, but it's actually incredibly narrow in terms of the work that it looks at. The market perpetuates a romantic notion of, of the artist because it's the easiest one to understand and it's the most abstract idea that you can attach to any given work of art. It doesn't matter what the work of art is like as long as it's come from this romantic notion of pure, this pure artist. Um, so in that sense, it still persists. But amongst all the rest of everything else I've shown you, nobody who's, who's been an artist in Africa uh, since the 50s believes, I mean, it's not very romantic, has not been a romantic story. So anyone who's persisted and worked their way through what they've had to do to get their work done and get their work seen, it's not romantic. Final point, if it's the case uh, that either here or elsewhere, the institutions are relatively few, dominated by relatively few people, are inflexible and exclude people. If that's the case, all those other infrastructural forms of creating your own environment to show your own work and make it public must be pursued. And because they're the ones that have shifted the, the big institutions in the well-provided places enormously. And in fact, it's got to a point where the big institutions, even though the very biggest ones like the Met, have so many people coming, that you know, and, and, but so many people coming just to be there rather than look at art or, you know, relate to art in any critical or deep sense. That's one set of problems. But 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 more more deeply. Um, They've had to transform themselves in absolutely major ways, some of them into virtual museums and things like that, to engage with the sort of energy that you're talking about. And you, you can use the romantic notion of the artist for a while, but it doesn't last very long. It's not a deep idea. It doesn't connect with contemporaneity. Next question. Um, I've got two questions, uh, one and a half of them are serious and the half of them is joking. So firstly the serious ones. Uh, to what extent in this system of relationship between the uh, artist and then up to the art historian, what's the role of the art manager in that? Can the art manager take up some of the curatorial functions? and maybe in the future all the curator's work will be done by an art manager and so it will be the death of curator. And so, half-jokingly, what are the strange chemical and physical processes that have to take place in the head of a person to become a curator? Uh, good. Um, uh, there, are, there used to be, uh, I mean, so the word gallerist, okay, gallerist, can we do, is that all right? Uh, is a term that came up in recent years. When, when I got involved in art in the 60s, there were art dealers, right? And then there were, um, uh, well, they're just out there. They weren't, in fact, what you call art managers. Um, there were no people managing hedge funds for art. There were no art administrators working for governments and giving out grants, if that's what you mean by art manager. 
but maybe he, you mean a more general, uh, a more general thing. It's um, it's possible there are tendencies occurring now where, for example, art funds are being set up. Um, there are people like Jeffrey Deitch, who's a very well known person in the United States, who had his own gallery, then he became a gallery director, total disaster. Now he's back um, doing what he knows well, which is supporting the financing of art. So there are people like that who are very important um, in a capitalist system for distributing art. Um, but they're not very important in most parts of the world. They're not very significant um, in, um, within the larger picture that I'm talking about. And the only danger with a term like art manager, um, if you mean a person who manages groups of people who go and look at works of art, uh, well, that's a role. It's not a very critical role, it's a role. I'm just not clear what... I think it's um, um, art, art, administrator. Oh, art more, administrator, more along the lines of art ah, administration. Yeah. Okay. Art administrators are really important people, um, particularly in situations where, where there's governmental support um, or private foundation support for art practice. When the market doesn't support art or only supports certain kinds of art. Um, to me, um, art administrators of that kind since the 60s have been as important as curators, sometimes more important, because in our country, for example, in Australia, we have uh, what's called the Australia Council, which is a funding organisation, and the individuals who have worked there, graduates from my department uh, who I've taught, um, some of them artists, many of them art historians, trained as art historians and so on and so forth. Um, these people have been crucial in creating structures to support contemporary artists and they do so on a very big scale for a very long time. Other ones have worked in alternative art spaces. Like we have in Australia, in every capital city, a place like this, but it's funded by the local government, um, and by the state government and by grants from the national government. Entirely funded. Um, pretty much at the scale that's, that happens here. Maybe not a big building, but close. So depends on what country that you're in. Um, anyway, so art managers uh, are not, not the problem if they take a critical approach to their work. <laughs> but they've got the, they're subject to the same, um, if you like, demands that I've been trying to say are true for curators and for artists and for art historians. So we have time for two more questions. У меня такой вопрос. My question is: Have you got an approach for developing criteria of evaluating a work of art? And if you've got such an approach, then what criteria do you use uh, for that to evaluate a work of art? Okay. The short answer to that: One could write a whole book about this. Mm -hmm. One has written whole books about this. The short answer to that is that. The quality of a work of art is not the same quality in every work of art. It's not something that I can go around and just pick like that. The quality of a work of art accumulates from the process uh, of its making. And to understand whether a work of art is good or not, um, which it's important to do, so I still believe absolutely that it's very important to make such judgments. You must first ask yourself, um, what is this work of art uh, made of? What's in it? What does it look like? What is it about? What can I recognize in front of me? Okay. Then it's important to try and understand how was it made, right? Understand the what the artist went through to make this work. And then you get a sense of, uh, you must ask yourself, uh, when was it made? Because we're talking about criteria that applies to the past as well as the present. You know, In what circumstances was this work of art made? 
And by the time you've done those three things, you've started to see that this particular work of art was made in a way that's very particular, very special, that's distinct from some other works of art, was made better or worse in this detail, given that it's in this medium, than another work of art. Um, and then you gradually sense what the artist intended or what the possible meaning of the work, even beyond what the artist intended, might be. What might its meaning be? And how can this meaning, how does, what does this meaning tell me about what it is to be in the world now or in the world of the time that the work of art was made? So one should work through that, which you must do for every work of art that you see, right? If you're being responsible for this work, you know, if you're going to be responsible to this work, um, if you follow that process, by the time you've finished it, you will have a clear idea about whether it is a good work of art or not. Okay? The perfect formula. Thank you. So we have one question there and one question there. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, um, my question is. Could you name your favorite work of a contemporary artist and a favorite work among the classics? Have you got any favorites? Absolutely not going to answer that question. Okay? No, because it, um, it asks me to reduce everything I've said to two things, which you must not ever do. I've just explained to you that uh, no, it's really important to to not think in a way that allows that question to even enter your mind. Um, works of art today are made in such different circumstances, so many different places, for so many different reasons, under so many different demands, that they count and become important because of all the demands, because of the place they come from, and where they're going and what they have to tell us about it. Every work I showed you, except, you know, Jeff Koons and so on, I admire greatly as a work that I showed you today. There are 400 works of art in my book, Contemporary Art World Currents. I chose a few of them to be representative, but I think all of them are major works of art, really significant works of art, for reasons I described in the book. Um, so when you do history, you have to make these judgments. You have to choose 400 works of art out of the millions made in the past 20 years. And I think I chose the best ones, and I will defend all the choices I made. Okay? So that's why I don't give you one answer um, to past or present. Okay? I can't do that. Next question. Good afternoon. Um, my question is the following. Uh, do you think it's possible to create a link between political struggle, political activism and art? If you think it's possible, then in what way it could be realized? I think it's an important issue for our country, because here the link between art and politics is kind of radicalized due to the revolution in history, and even if you take the contemporary condition, the practices of actionists like Voina or Pussy Riot, it's a radical straddling of this uh, border between art and politics. But currently in the intellectual discourse around art, important thinkers such as Jacques Rancière think that it's not practicable, art is dying or whatever, but they, they don't allow for that. What do you think on this issue, from your experience, from your condition, from your context? Really important, really important question. Um, okay, so I'm, I was, I'm a child of the late 1960s, late 1960s, and we believed then, and I still believe now, that art can transform the world, right? Not the art world 
not the structures that I spoke about, not the market, and not any one work of art. Right? So not the whole and not any one work of art will transform the world. Um, both of those are mistakes because every time you ask that one work of art transforms the world, it will fall short and you give up on all of art. On the other hand, if you say all art must be political, that's not going to happen either. That will fail too. But these are, these are kind of questions and expectations that conservatives and people running the market and people defending their political power, that's what they put out there. That's the criteria they put out there. It's nothing to do with political art practice. So making art politically, rather than just doing political art, um, that's something I think that's actually being debated in this country, and that's, I mean, that's why I showed Gilea's work. So he's operating, he's making art politically by parody, <coughs> through the idea of parody, right? And he's taken Boris Groys's idea about Stalin, that Stalin created the ideal constructivist work of art, right? um, made a whole state, I mean, took avant-garde ideas about totally transforming the world for the social good of everybody, that the artists had and applied them to society as a whole, which is a, again a parodic way of saying, saying something really important. You see, a lot of the people running our societies today don't know what they're doing. I have to try and find out what they're doing by experimenting with all of us to see what will work for them and their friends and the people they support. There's an extraordinary level of, of literally huge scale experimentation going on. Um, adjusting the bits of the economy, doing this here and there. But without, nobody has a clear picture of what a future society is like or should be like um, in a way that produces equity and coevalness and the things I'm speaking about. So, um, so all of my life I've actually either worked with or found um, or written about artists and artists' work that does create political change, social change, ethical change, make ethical demands, um, ask you to think about being a different kind of person, all of which is political, all of it's political. Um, and I've paid, less, I've paid attention to art that's by its nature conservative um, and just holds up a mirror to the rich, which is what, again, Jeff Koons and Damien Hurst and Murakami and people like that do. Good luck to them. Um, but it's not a serious, it's not a serious practice. Um, it doesn't answer your questions. Uh, that art doesn't. So, I mean, so that's how I see it. I actually see political possibility across a, a whole range, but it's very specific to where the artist is making the work and what the circumstances are. It's again not a set of qualities, you know, that you could just see by, by looking, that anyone coming from another culture can suddenly just see, oh, that's political art and that isn't political art. Huh? It's not about obvious public politics depends on what the situation is that you're acting in. So my answer is that it's more situational, but it's very widespread. And the larger currents that I've spoken about are literally transforming the world. The distribution of power in the world is really shifting from being concentrated in certain parts of the United States, in certain markets and rich people, um, certain international uh, forms of capital they're very strong and very powerful, but all the other changes that are occurring in the world are shifting that, and all of them are massive political transformations, and artists are involved in all of them at all levels, I think. Okay. So one last quick question, and then we will go for book signing in uh, the entrance part of Shigaruban. Good evening. Oh, we will make the signing here after this last question and a big cheers to Terry. Yes, we need to. Uh,
Uh, my question actually consists of two parts, and I apologize, apologize if it may be too stupid for you. <laughs> uh, the first one, um, can an art curator be roughly compared to a newspaper editor? Is that correct or not? And the second one, if so, uh, how can actually works of art, to what extent they may be edited actually? I mean, manipulating with sense, with implications, stuff like that. Thank you. Okay. Actually, that's a metaphor. I think Robert Stahl, Robert Stahl used that metaphor in an essay in a book called, um, how to, Marin Kohler's book, How to Create a Great I, Exhibition. How to Make a Great Exhibition, yeah, yeah. Um, other comparisons are to a film director. Um, there's many metaphors for, for being a curator. But you've got to ask yourself, which part of the process are you talking about? So when you say a newspaper editor, um, you're drawing, it, it makes maybe a bit of sense as a parallel, not so much to the curating of an individual exhibition, but to organising a program of exhibitions in a museum over a period. Because don't forget a newspaper editor is not a reporter, not a research journalist, uh, so not an activist or engaged figure in that sense. A newspaper editor organises other people's work, you know, yeah. So uh, the organises the reporter's work. But, so I think the parallel would be more with a museum director and a newspaper editor, I mean, to, you know, to be specific. But the metaphors for curating, um, again, depend on the part of the process you're talking about. And uh, it's, it's true that choosing which works go in an exhibition to make up an overall story, right, is it's probably closer to what an investigative journalist does to write a series of stories or reports over a period about something and win a Pulitzer Prize or something like that. That's, that would be closer to curatorial practice. Because in that case, the journalist is thinking in terms of a series of articles and making interviews with people and gathering facts and imagining a story. Okay? So there's lots of metaphors for curating. Another one is a theatre director. Right? Or, or a cinema director. But it depends on which particular kind of exhibition you're doing. But they're, they're all about choosing things or setting up relationships between sets of works of art to generate a meaning that the individual works of art don't have and that's a new kind of meaning. Yeah. So in that sense, you're close to an analogy but I've got to be pedantic and you've got to get an exact analogy. Okay. So Terry, I want to say thank you very much for your um, incredible, um, kind of the amount of work that you've done on thinking through what curating actually is. There isn't anybody else who has actually thought from the outside, from outside the curatorial profession and paid as much attention to what, what it is that we do. So thank you for that, thank you for tonight and um, without further ado, join me in, uh, in clapping Terry.